Hi, everyone, and welcome again for another EMI seminar series. We have two great speakers uh, today. We have Professor Anne Sartek and Professor Barbara Simpson, and they will both be speaking on really relevant topics to our dynamics community. We'll get started with uh, Anne this, uh, this afternoon. She will be presenting on adaptive and deployable lightweight civil infrastructure. And she is currently an assistant professor at University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. And we'll go ahead and get started. Thank you so much. And right after her presentation, we'll have Dr. Simpson as well uh, give you the presentation. Great, thank you, Antonetta, for the uh, introduction. Hi, my name is Ann Sixesh, and I'm glad to be here. Um, let's get this rolling. All right, so, there we go. I'm going to minimize that so I can see the whole screen. Um, there, uh, I, I gave that away. Uh, so uh, my work is on adaptive and deployable structures. So it has a use in structural dynamics. It is a component of it. And we're day by day going even more into the structural dynamics of it rather than just a static form. So this is just two of the projects that uh, we do in our lab right now, or have are working on. So uh, my lab is the Smarty Lab, and I'm Canadian. So Smarties are a, a chocolate candy that's coated. And uh, in the US, Smarties are a little different. They're actually not chocolate. So the joke is that like Halloween, we have this like Canada US, like little friendly competition of like which Smarties are better, but it ends up just that everyone is hopped up on sugar and we're all happy and it's fine. But so that there's a little bit of a fun aspect about our lab. Um, I am also affiliated with uh, mechanical engineering because this is structural engineering and it's something that moves. So it made a lot of sense to also be with mechanical. When I mentioned about adaptive structures, it's a concept that isn't put into practice often in large structures in real life, things that would change based on sensor input not just a standard bridge that goes up and down, let's say, because that changes shape, but that's different. So on the left-hand side, you have a demonstrator tower that's 10 stories tall at the University of Stuttgart. It is adaptive where the trusses themselves can uh, are pistons, essentially, they're actuators and can change the whole deflection of the building. So this is a very large demonstration of adaptive structures. You have uh, the top right there, you have a, an adaptive deck, which can negate in real time the deflection due to footfalls. So it's a very thin, very slender structure. And so you can really reduce the, the depth of that. Um, that was done at EPFL. You, know, you have adaptive facades that can use sensors for uh, solar radiation. You can also use natural ventilation and change the opening or closing of these facades to facilitate the building comfort. You also have a shell structure that's also at the University of Stuttgart, uh, no longer in place, but was there to change the curvature of the shell to idealize um, the, the low distribution in that shell using robotic movement of the supports. And then on the bottom right is a adaptive tensegrity structure, again, with that um, riffing on that compression member being the adaptive element. So that's kind of what was the precursor to my PhD work that I'll be covering a little bit in this talk as well. So this idea of when that shape changing uh, is obviously something that could, there's a lot of possibilities there. Um, we have this, these structures are coupled, they're deployable, and this the sensegrity structure is an ideal test bed for that because it's a set of bars and cables that have to be held in a state of self-stress. Just the cables and bars alone won't won't cut it with these topologies. Otherwise, if it didn't have the self-stress, it would just be a you know a truss structure. So you have Buckminster Fuller with the the ball, his iconic tensegrity ball. Um, something you may have seen on Reddit is this idea of like a floating table or floating chair, just due to that compression and tension in there. Um, keep in mind, this has all been done mostly statically. There have been wonderful dynamic solutions to tensegrity structures in an idealized form. Our lab is actually trying to go from that idealized into the real and manu like you know, con constructed large scale structure that you see on that right hand side is a 12 foot long or four meter long uh, deployable tensegrity structure. I'm Canadian, I'm bilingual French and English, but I'm also bilingual in terms of units as well. So some of this presentation will be um, in metric and I can convert for anyone using US standard as well. 
Um, this is the above view of the 10 degree structure I worked on during my PhD work on uh, two halves of a deployable structure um, with this topology that was uh, concept conceptualized by René Motreau from the University of Montpellier. Um, and it is not a class one tensegrity structure, it's a class four between the modules. Uh, for those who are familiar with tensegrity structures, it is a more redundant structure. It's not your base, uh, like Snelson, Buckminster, Fuller style tensegrity structure, but it's inspired from that. Two halves that deploy out from those concrete supports you see on the sides, facilitated by five motors on each side. So it's a kind of a pentagonal shape. All those motors can independently roll and unroll cable. So there are 10 motors, 10 different points of actuation. And for such a large structure, and we're talking about dynamics here, we actually moved this slow enough so that we had a quasi-static state because with the inertia of the structure, even though it's 200 kilos, um, the semi-real-time control that we had was not something we wanted to challenge at this point. We wanted to go quasi-static quasi for the purposes of safety of the structure, safety in the lab, and also because this is fairly, fairly novel also for its size. The two halves uh, connect in the center with an electromagnet, um, so that was completely hands-off, which was uh, we'll see in a, in a video later. The continuous cable, which was connected from the motors all the way to the end of the structure with that dot dashed line, is the one that would be rolled and unrolled. There were also cables that were short, just like one joint to another, simple ones that we'll talk about a bit later, because damage detection, we have to see if something's healthy or not throughout its lifespan. That's where adaptive structures, deployable structures, really become different than what we see in outer space applications, because we have a much longer lifespan than, um, let's say, a, a space mission. We have a 50, 100 year light building life cycle. So what we were doing in terms of control is that we would be using a model that was using a quasi-static method uh, or a static solution um, called uh, dynamic relaxation. Even though it's got dynamic in the name, it is a static solution for finding just at least the joint displacements and your forces and comparing that to our sensors that we had around the structure. We actually had a whole 3D optical tracking system connected to the, uh, like installed at the supports to collect your global XYZ positions of particular nodes. And we compared that to those positions uh, in the model. So the blue line is at least an empirical way of getting the two halves in the lab to connect with each other. No, fan, no, no uh, new creation of, uh, uh, of how to move the motors, just at least what worked in the lab. There was quite a bit of uncertainty. We want to reduce that. By comparing the model to the measurements, four times, so four feedback cycles, we were able to shorten up that, um, that that deployment sequence and also reduce the error a bit, but it still had room for improvement. If we did 20 feedback cycles using the same base code that we had for just getting it done, so the empirical, the blue, but just um, compared to the model and to the measurements and updated, we could get the pink line, which had much less uncertainty and a much smoother deployment. So when we do go to a dynamic faster deployment when we have inertia aspects, uh, we would have less fatigue issues over the lifespan of the structure. Now we could do 20, 21, 30 cycles, but after a while, um, the amount of time for it to render after each step cycle evaluate um, would take more computer time. Even though the deployment itself takes less time, the amount of chugging of the computer just was more, so there's a, a return on investment there. There was also the aspect of when the structure was super compressed, um, it was, it was a, up to 40 centimeters, the smallest compaction out of uh, two meters fully expanded. Those bars could easily get jammed against each other and then get completely stuck in the deployment. Well, we wouldn't like that. I mean, obviously we wanted to be successful. So we used a uh, rapidly exploring random tree, not just that, but the optimized version and a connect concept where we have a tree of path that grows from the start in black you see here, and a tree that grows from the end point, this is our deployed state, that's in gray that comes from the right to the left. And those two trees, once they move incrementally in a sequence that goes around the boundary conditions, once those two trees meet, it's a successful pathway for all those motors to move the structure. 
Normally, rapidly exploring random tree is a boundary condition issue where you navigate through space, but the structure itself in this case is the boundary condition. On top of that, every iteration step is it's it, the boundary conditions are changing, which means you have to evaluate the boundary to conditions each time, which is kind of that cutaway that you see on that right hand side. It's trying to navigate through struts and everything in 3D space. This was really useful. It took obviously more computational effort, but we want to only use this when the possibility of getting the bars jammed up against each other was more likely. We didn't want to have to deal with contact mechanics and bending of the bars and flexural stresses in those com in the compression elements. It's less ideal and also for fatigue and survivability of the structure. We want to limit that. This is the implementation of the RRT Connect for the first part, even deployment throughout, so no, uh, no algorithms. And then when it came to the center, we used feedback, again, to compare the model and the measurements of where they were in space. In this case, we're also comparing where the nodes on the right-hand side and the left-hand side were until they could get closer to each other, getting those control commands for the motors to get them to connect. You'll also notice that those top nodes, they connect first because we're in a land of gravity and those top nodes, because of two cantilevers effectively, are gonna connect first and then the other nodes will follow. If we had a less uh, lesser gravity situation, then we would have a different uh, deployment pattern, but this is gonna be true for a lot of civil structures. In terms of now, you know, lifespan, the health of the structure, can we determine whether the damage has been detected? And then where has that damage been occurring? So first we're using uh, natural frequencies to detect whether the health of the structure, with the, the frequency has changed from a healthy state. And if it's changed significantly, then we should consider it something has changed structurally about it. And then the second part is using an error domain model falsification, a falsification method based on a generative uh, set of models to compare the measurements to possible scenarios that we can model easily using statistics. I did mention um, we had individual cables from point to point, and those are ones that we damaged. We're clicking electromagnet to pop them open rather than one of those long continuous cables, just because it was uh, easier to repeat and obviously deflections were going to be more manageable in the lab. So the four that you see there. In terms of how to detect whether it's been damaged or not, is we have an output only um, natural frequency set. We use the second order uh, blind identification. So looking at your autocorrelation and your cross-correlation statistics to try and parse out your different modes and your different frequencies. So this is what we use for whether it's been damaged or not. Sample the first three frequencies, whether it's been healthy, which is that second column. And then when we had damaged or clicked open one of those cables, you saw the change in frequency there. They were all individually damaged. They weren't all together. Otherwise, the deflections were larger than what could be accommodated in the lab. But you would see if that precision, meaning that kind of the threshold, had been exceeded. So if that change was over the threshold, we would say, yeah, a damage has been detected. OK. If some were and some weren't, we'd say damage was possible. And obviously, we checked the null case of no change physically had done been done to the structure and whether that had been detected as healthy or not. So this is how we were checking at least yes or no, has something changed? Then the question is, where is that change? Now, this was using the idea of having a bunch of um, measurements from the structure. They obviously have their own uncertainties. So the statistical properties of you know your centers themselves. And then you have your model and your assumptions, things like friction in the cables or the eccentricity of the, the actual joints themselves. And those have statistical properties. So building in that statistical range within the models and generating a whole suite of model possibilities, you compare that to the measurements. If the model does not match the measurements, you exclude it until you whittle down to a smaller subset of models that make sense, that describe what is happening to the structure. And that gives the indication of which is the candidate scenario, which element is the one that's being that had been damaged. Why we can't just do a normal you know, analysis? Well, we have tons of load paths in tensegrity structures. We have 
um, your different stress fields, like your 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 pathways for your load. And so, you know, one damage can create a whole new set of uh, load flow. It's hard to target that. This really did help. So what we see here is kind of like a heat map of like of uh, of those results being the maximum likelihood candidate. Then you have the ones that start to deviate by um, your sigmas away from that area. It was much more kind of nicely distributed for cables. We also did it for struts as well. I did it after I had my PhD in hand because damaging those uh, struts was way more difficult to reinstall. Uh, cables are much easier because those bars span a much larger area. But this is one of the heat maps that we have from this work. On the Tensegrity uh, side, uh, we have the advanced computing algorithms being the RRT star connect and the real-time feedback or the quasi real-time feedback that really help improve not only deployment, but once we have detected that the damage had happened, it can actually help repair the structure to put it to a usable state. Um, so uh, we also did it with some aluminum tensegrity structure work that we're currently doing. Um, for the sake of brevity, I, I did not show those slides, but if you have questions about that, please let me know. There's nothing, uh, there's no robotics in it yet, but it's to come. Next part is about origami structures. So origami, you have your uncut sheets, you have valleys and mountain folds, and it's developable from a, a flat sheet. Rigid foldability is a really interesting aspect of it. So you have your rigid panels and your soft hinges. So you can make it into a dragon like you see on the left, or you can have the mirror ori that's the pattern on the right, very uh, mathematically useful for proving some of our, our concepts because it's a really go-to shape. Of course, I'm thinking actuations, but how do you get it? Do you move? Um, we want it to move consistently because normally we have a piece of paper, we can do it by hand. So what about if we have actuators that make the structure move in the longitudinal direction that you see there? How many of those do you need? Um, this is a question that, uh, whether you do continuous cables or in independent cables or independent actuators, it all kind of depends on your scale, the cost that is going to be associated with it, what kind of shapes you're trying to achieve. So this is not just one answer for all things, but depends on your application. So we're exploring a lot of different options for this. In terms of modeling, though, we had to make a little bit of a change because when it came to tensegrity structures, those hinges are effectively three nodes to rotate. Um, there wasn't any type of friction, not significantly. Um, but when it comes to folding a paper, the actual action of folding paper takes a certain amount of force. There's a rigidity in it. So that takes energy. What you see here is the general flow for dynamic relaxation. However, with that blue box being calculating the energy from folding of the hinges and bending of the panels. I said it was mostly rigid, but I mean, you think paper still flexes, so those panels can 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 torque. We tried the mirror ori. It went wonderfully. We're happy with it, but we're like, okay, can we get a shape that could be super flat pack and then get a shell-like structure? So we got inspired from pill bugs or roly polies or armadillos, which whichever one uh, resonates with you. This idea of a flat structure that rolls up into a ball. Um, for dynamic relaxation purposes, we model the panels as bars and hinges. This comes from also an energy method that was uh, developed by Evgeny Filipov. But we have to have that rigidity at those hinges. So what you see on the right-hand side is the model version of the pill bug you see on the left. And we've had a few versions. We had version 1.0 that was about a meter long, and this is version 2.0, laser cut wood with friction hinges. So we actually still have resistance at those hinges. And we have now motorized control with continuous cables running along the bottom, kind of where the feet of the uh, roly poly would be to control the the, um, the rolling in of the structure. And it can start a flat pack or nearly flat. If it's completely flat, it's a uh, bi-stable structure. So slightly rolled into the, into the shell structure. As you see on the side, we're actually using a uh, Submillimeter accuracy infrared markers on the front face of the structure to measure not only position but also strain in those panels. We're looking currently at damage detection within the structure. So, can we model the high energy locations, kind of the areas of concern, um, and then being able to target where those damages may happen and how to adjust the rolling or the shape movement of the structure? So, very similar to the tensegrity structure 
journey, but now with a panel-like structure, which is super exciting. Throughout the rolling process, this, we were measuring the vibration of uh, the structure. So we were using the submillimeter sub accuracy sensors as an actual way to measure vibration. You can see that there was a, um, a change in the spectral density from the unrolled state, which is a mostly flat structure, to intermediate states all the way to that rolled state, which is more rounded. We're doing some more work on this to get a better characterization of the whole structure, but this were our preliminary results, which we were very excited to see that we do have obviously a change in the peak natural frequency, where we're getting some more kind of in-between information at the moment. And then obviously we're getting to larger scales and we're getting, we're looking at the models. So we're seeing here in the blue line is our experimental results of the unrolled state all the way to the rolled state of the structure and as, as well as the two sigma of the experimental. So it's quite tight overall. So we're really happy about that. And then the comparison to the analytical, which is that dynamic relaxation model. Again, it's a static model. We're doing incremental steps and we're doing the, we use that for the shape of the structure. We are like, okay, that's a static analysis. We then have that geometry put into a finite element model to find the natural frequency of the structure at that shape. So it's um, we're kind of grabbing the, the geometry, at least from the dynamic relaxation. It does deviate a bit. We are looking at addressing some more of those uncertainties because construction at larger scales, this will happen. So we're really excited for future work on this as well. Here's a video of the actual structure rolling. We have it from the side here. Um, we are working on a bunch of different like practical aspects like friction and tracking and even more of our sensors where possible. We do have strain gauges as well to compare to our optical tracking. So in terms of actuated origami, that dynamic relaxation module that we added to the analysis was really helpful, not just for mirror ori, but now has been proven for several geometries with more generalized. That energy that we measured from that first part is also really good at detecting where damage could be occurring or where are good sensor locations. So in terms of like applications, you have to get building components, emergency pop-up shelters, and it does change stiffness throughout its rolling. So there's also a really interesting uh, application there as well. So I can't do without my lab team. Um, they have been wonderful, fantastic in this work. So um, we have people working on the origami, on tensegrity structures. We also have deployable underground work that's going on. So no vibration there yet, but cyclical loading is a thing that we will be addressing in the future. Um, and then I'd also like to thank uh, our office here, our funding to make this work possible. That'll be it from me. And uh, love to pass the torch on to our next speaker. Yes, thank you so much for your insightful presentation. So I also invite our participants to leave the questions uh, in the chat so that we can address them after uh, Dr. Simpson has presented. So thank you so much. Uh, we'll go ahead and welcome our next speaker and go ahead and simulating the wave induced response of structures using real time hybrid physical numerical simulation. Go ahead. Great. Thank you. Everybody can hear me okay? Great, great. And, and that was an awesome presentation. I'm sorry that I missed your presentation when you were here a couple of weeks ago. Um, I'm gonna be talking about something that that my group has been working on for a few years now. Um, and I, I just wanna do a shout out to the actual students that are doing the majority of the work, um, two of which are actually on this call. Um, and there's a lot of contributors to this this work. So, so even though I'm presenting a small part of it, I just want everybody to know that there's a whole team um, behind a lot of the simulations I'm gonna show. Um, and I'll give a, a, a brief outline on, on what I'm gonna talk about. I'll, I'll sort of start about start out with this motivation. Um, and we're sort of seeking to extend our experimental facilities um, that, are, that are mostly inducing wave loading on structural systems. Um, and we're especially interested in systems that are subject to multiple dynamics. And I'll sort of define what that is in a second. Um, and I'll sort of go through some test cases uh, that we're working on right now, where we're applying this idea of hydrodynamic real-time simulation, which we're sort of referring to as hydro, RTHS for short. Um, and, and we'll sort of look at the different examples. And then we'll sort of go into um, this multi-physics approach and and sort of define uh, what, what we're looking at when, when we're actually um, considering these simulations, what are the challenges, um, and, and what are 
some different ways to actually extend this work into the future. I think there's a lot of room um, for refinement and improvement. And I really hope that this space sort of opens up to other researchers so that more people can contribute to this area. Um, so let's just start out with this motivation, uh, this idea of, of sort of looking and setting these systems that are that are governed by uh, multiple physical laws um, and, and a, a, a very classical what I'm going to refer to as a multi-dynamical system would be an offshore wind turbine. Of course, there's many other types of systems that we could look at. Um, and so here on, on the left, you have a, a very, very common monopile offshore wind turbine, and, and it's subject to a lot of different different forcing functions. Um, so you have the aerodynamics coming from the wind. Uh, you have maybe some sort of control scheme that allows the rotor to, to yaw or the blades to pitch in order to align that wind turbine with that wind. Uh, you have the structural dynamics of the tower itself. Um, you have potential current and hydrodynamics of waves um, that are also imparting loading onto the structure. And then you could have some soil structure interaction effect. And so there's a long bucket list of different forces that all have their own unique dynamics. And you know, if those, those frequencies of the dynamics are close to each other, they actually tend to interact with one another. Um, and, and, and so these are the type of systems that I'm kind of referring to when I'm talking about these, these multi-dynamic systems. And, and the reality is that it's very difficult to simulate all these dynamics simultaneously. Um, and so there's a tendency to look at one piece of the problem. When, when it comes to an, an experimental test, um, this actually becomes even more difficult just because you have spatial limitations in, in, in these, these experimental facilities, specifically hydrodynamic facilities, um, so you're forced to only look at a portion of the problem, in this case, a, a structural component uh, subjected to wave loading at full scale. Um, you might be able to look at things um, at a smaller scale when it comes to, say, an isolated building. And then when you're actually looking at something over a region, um, let's say at the community level, then, then you, they're looking at something that even becomes more idealized. And the reality of this is most of these systems, except the one on the middle where they did seek to sort of scale the structural stiffness. Um, they actually looked at nail patterns to, to get that structural system down to a to small scale. But most of the time, unless you're at full scale, um, the, the realistic mass damping stiffness properties, potential for nonlinear behavior in the structural system is often neglected. And in many cases that might not matter, but, but you know, in the case of the monopile wind turbine I just showed, uh, there, there is actually reason to include the structural dynamics in this fluid structure interaction problem. Um, this problem becomes even worse when you start looking at sort of multiple fluids acting on the system. Again, in this case, we have a floating offshore wind turbine. Um, and here's a number of, of different facilities that basically have a fan floating over a wave basin. Um, and, and the issue with this is that the control volume that those fans uh, actually supply the wind and it, it is really, really hard to maintain. You see how these fans have to be really, really close to the turbine itself. Um, and, and then even worse, there's actually distortions that happen when you scale both the waves and the wind down to look at these small scale um, small scale specimens. In this case, these are mostly at 1 to 50, 1 to 30th scale. Um, and to deal with those distortions, you might uh, distort the scaling of the blade, the geometric scaling of the, the blade in order to satisfy the Reynolds number. Um, but in reality, it's it's very difficult to, to scale all these physics at one time. And I'll sort of explain the reason for that uh, in a few slides. Um, and so, so in light of these um, sort of issues with looking at this problem, uh, we've sort of been seeking to develop this hydrodynamic RTHS approach. And you know we've been fairly lucky enough to have opportunities to apply this to a number of different applications. Um, but what it does is it says, well, you know, if we can't really experimentally look at this problem and look at all the physics involved, um, perhaps what we can do is take some of the physics that are well understood, but but maybe aren't really associated with the hydrodynamics itself. Um, and let's extract that and put it into a numerical model. Um, so I sort of see this as a virtual extension of our existing physical experiment. So we have a physical experiment, but now we're virtually extending it by coupling it to a numerical model. And that coupling is really the hybrid approach. So we're gonna use the governing equations of motion to sort of couple the physical components with the numerical components. And then we're gonna ensure that we have equilibrium and compatibility across that partition. Um, so that's the, the, hybrid, uh, the hybrid simulation setup. Um, 
the issue with that um, is that unfortunately, um, that wave is actually moving at real time. And I, I'm not sure how well these videos are actually coming through. Um, so this was one of the initial tests that we did. And you can see the wave machine at the end of the large wave flume at Oregon State University coming in. And, and unfortunately, we can't slow down the fluid flow. Um, and so that coupling does have to occur in real time. And that's why we're sort of referring to it as real time hybrid simulation. Um, as, so the example that you see here um, is us looking at this in a very traditional way. This was one of the first experiments that we did. We had a physical wave uh, impacting a bridge pier and we were looking at sort of tsunami-like waves, solitary waves um, that, were, that were actually supplied to the, the model in an experiment that was coupled to, to a full-scale um, bridge model that you see on the left. Um, and we were able to actually look at this in sort of a tier to, we, we kind of assume that if both peers received identical loading, then we could look at a, a two-peer uh, bridge system that you see here. And then actually what we did is um, we were able to supply sort of offline earthquake loading. And so the idea of, of this is that there's been quite a few um, failures of uh, tsunami following earthquakes. Um, an example being the Tohoku uh, tsunami earthquake uh, earthquake tsunami sequence in Japan. And so what we were able to do is we were numerically damaged the system uh, in the numerical part of this model. And then we were able to experimentally supply the wave loading. And so, you know, by that, we were sort of idealistically looking at this cascading earthquake tsunami effect. So it was this one of the first applications of, of the, the hydro RTHS approach. Um, one that's been more recent has been looking at uh, monopile offshore wind. Um, and so you see sort of a very similar specimen to what you saw on the previous slide. Um, but this time we were actually uh, having a structural dynamics model of the remainder of the tower. We subjected the hub to some predetermined um, wind forcing function. Uh, and then we actually also um, had, uh, we were able to look at soil at the base um, due to sort of some some very unique aspects to this particular test setup where we had a pin in the, the physical experiment. Um, and then we were able to actually have a numerical model representing potential nonlinearities at that soil structure interface. Again, very idealized. Um, a lot of this is still a uh, very proof of concept. Um, but, you know, we were able to look at monopile offshore wind subjected to both wind waves and soil effects in this particular experiment. Um, and then the one that's actually uh, going on right now, I have two students up at Oregon State and we're going to be testing this month in early June. Um, is to actually looking at the floating case of that. Um, and so when we originally proposed this, this project to Department of Energy, um, what we said is that we were going to have sort of a, a wind um, that rather than an offline way, we would actually use the motions um, from, the, the, from the floating platform to update the wind loading, and then we would command it uh, in our physical experiment. So in this case, the wind loading is actually our numerical model. Um, and you can see the figure on the right. This was some bench testing we did last year. Um, where we're using a robotic arm to actually uh, supply that wind loading. So, you know, sort of a different iteration than what we actually ended up proposing. Um, so, so that test is actually occurring right now. Um, and, you know, we're very excited to actually, uh, we, we've been working on this for a number of years. So we're very actually excited to get the culmination of that project. Um, something else that we're thinking about is um, as we're looking at uh, floating offshore wind, um, the, the water depths off the Pacific coast are extremely deep, uh, 90 meters plus potentially. Um, and so there is this question of if we're going to look at these systems in a laboratory setting where we have control of what's going on, um, we have an issue with that many of our basins aren't deep enough uh, to actually look at a deep water problem. Um, and so we're using hybrid simulation. In this case, this project's just ramping up. Uh, to look at truncated mooring lines. Um, and so, you know, we'll actually use the numerical model to extend the depth of, of our wave basins. Um, and then we'll be able to look at uh, something that's that's more in line with the depths that we would see, say, off the coast of California, where we're expecting floating offshore wind to be built in the next decade. Um, so these are the different applications, um, but I, I want to kind of dig into to what actually we're doing here and what it actually means to sort of approach these, these multiple dynamic systems. Um, and so, you know, just as a reminder, um, the, the example of the floating offshore wind case is, is, is subject to many different um, dynamic forces. And, and ideally, when we scale this down to actually fit these specimens in 
in our, our, our physical lab spaces, uh, we want to make sure that the equations of motion are, are pretty much satisfied between the full prototype scale and then, then the small scale that we're dealing with. Um, the issue with that is if we look at the aerodynamics, um, that is typically scaled by Reynolds number scaling. Um, so that's typically looking at that ratio of inertial forces to viscous forces. If you look at the structural dynamics, we might be more interested with the elastic or restoring forces in the structural system. And if we look at the hydrodynamics, that's typically scaled by Froude, um, which is the ratio of the inertial to gravitational forces. And, and if, you, if you scale by one of these laws, you're by default distorting uh, the other forces acting on your system. Um, and so this can be really hard when you're looking at sort of these, these multiple dynamics all at one time at small model scale. Um, and so we've been sort of looking at that um, specifically uh, in this idea of wave wind coupling on, on a structural system. And, you know, here's an example of that monopile wind turbine on the left where we have prototype scale and we geometrically scale it down to model scale. And we, if we look at these different types of scaling laws, depending on you know, the governing forces in your system, um, to actually match the dynamics, you also have to scale time and along with that geometric scale um, in terms of length. And then you also have to scale the forces as well. And so let, let, let's say you know, we scale down to 20% in terms of the length scale. What you can see here is that when you compare these different sort of scaling laws, for the governing forces for the waves versus the wind versus the structure, um, they don't all scale proportionally. Um, and, and so, you know, you're, you're, you're forced to distort, distort the other forces in your dynamics if you're trying to sort of scale everything at once. So those, those previous experimental facilities where you have these fans over a wave basin um, are supplying distorted wind just because you can't have the wind and the waves scaled appropriately if you use just one length scale. Um, so hybrid simulation gives us an opportunity to actually correct for this. Um, so what we can do is we can actually keep, in this case, our hydrodynamics at small scale. And we could say that, that in our physical experiment, those hydrodynamics are gonna be um, sort of governed by whatever scaling law. Um, in this case, we're using Froude, but whatever forces you're most interested in on the physical side. And then we can actually have that numerical model be at full scale um, of the remaining structure, whatever additional physics, say the wind um, that you're interested in. And then the coupling, the hybrid simulation, rather than just equilibrium and compatibility is also going to include scaling up and down the relevant physics so that you can match them um, with your physical model. Um, so here's just an example of that. This is what we use for the monopile wind turbine. Um, so we have the equation of motion coupling the numerical model with the physical model. Um, we integrate that equation of motion in time and it uh, supplies a, a, a physical displacement in the experiment that's, that in this case is actuated and in a virtual set of displacements at the nodes of the numerical model. Uh, and then we then measure the force feedback to the, due to the wave and that's included in a scaled up version um, in those equations of motion. Um, and then we integrate in time to the next time step, send out the commands, have the sensor uh, measurements, give the feedback um, until we complete the remainder of the time series. Um, what gets to be really interesting about this is that when you scale um, the dynamics and you scale the forces, you also need to scale time so that you get that those similitude requirements um, in terms of matching the prototype dynamics with the, the model dynamics. Um, and so here, uh, what you'll see is that that numerical portion is receiving sort of full scale versions of the sensor measure measurements, in this case, forces due to the waves. Um, and the time scale um, is a little bit different. And so you actually need to make your numerical model um, sort of match the smaller scale down version of that time in the physical model. And so because everything's virtual, we can do that. We just need to make sure our computations are performing um, this, this we're, we're solving the equation of motion basically in faster than real time so that we match the scale of the small scale experiment. Um, now that could lead to a number of different challenges because there's challenges anyway with just real time simulation, but now we're doing faster than real time simulation. Um, and the extent to which that real time matters kind of depends on where you partition your system. Um, and so we're actually using OpenFast um, in, in the case of the floating offshore wind turbine to sort of solve 
uh, for the aerodynamics. Um, and we can choose a number of different partition points for that. Um, one could be, well, we're, we're going to use force control. Um, and so we actually partition the system um, composed of you know these many different dynamics that I've described earlier, where we actually have the aerodynamic model output a force, then we then supply to our physical system. Um, we could also sort of partition the system uh, in terms of the structural dynamics, in which case um, when you solve the equations of motion for the structure, sort of output a displacement or a motion. Um, and then we would supply that in, 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 in our physical system. And, and we've done both. Um, so in terms of that monophile offshore wind turbine, um, we have a, 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 a numerical model of our wind and structural dynamics that's at full scale. Um, we again integrate the equations of motion and that gives us a command displacement that, you know, we're, we're going to sort of scale down at the model scale. Um, and then we're going to measure uh, that force feedback um, and we're going to send that back to our numerical model and then we couple these together in time to make sure that they're sort of synchronized in time. Uh, something to note here that even though this is displacement control, um, something that you have to be really careful about is that the 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 waves themselves um, actually also depend on the velocity of, of the, the structural specimen. So you have to be really careful that even though you're controlling displacements, that your velocity still makes sense in your physical experiments because that's going to um, affect uh, your, your wave loading. So, you, you know, from a control standpoint, it, 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 you have to be a little bit careful um, in how you actually impose these commands in, in the physical experiment. Um, we've also done force control. Um, this is the case of the floating system. Uh, again, we're, we're doing the final testing of this uh, right now at Oregon State. Um, and so in that case, we're supplying an aerodynamic load at the hub um, that we're, we're, we're scaling down and um, doing a force control with our robotic arm at the model scale. And then we have a motion tracking system uh, where we're actually taking the displacements, estimating the velocities, and sending that measured motion back to update the aerodynamic load. And again, we have to synchronize these two systems. In this case, we have a scale of one to 50. And so we have to have our numerical model operating at about seven times faster than real time. Um, here, uh, we have a floating system. Um, and you have to think about buoyancy effects as well as added mass effects from the wave loading acting on the structural system. Where you place the mass matters. Um, so when you think about partitioning your governing equations, you have to sort of consider uh, where that mass is located. Um, and here's just some example results of what that might look like. And so the black line here would just be a typical scaled experiment without the hybrid simulation approach. This blue line um, would then be if we turn on that structural dynamics um, with the hybrid simulation. So now our structural dynamics is virtually supplied. And then here um, we have some idealized wind loading as well that's acting on the structural system. And so you can see sort of the interacting uh, components of, of these, these different parts um, that are all sort of acting together in this combined, this coupled uh, physical numerical simulation. Um, and so, how do we actually do this, um, given that it's faster than real time? Um, so what we've done is we've developed a relatively fast and flexible um, hydro RTHS architecture. Um, and, and a lot of it has to do with, uh, you know, our experience that we've had with now these a number of different applications. Um, here's just an example of, of those, the, those, those hydro RTHS results for the, the, the coupled cases of structural dynamics. Um, with the waves, um, what, what we're noticing here is that there is noise in those sensor measurements. Um, so in this case, this is a feedback from a load cell that we're then supplying to our equations of motion. Um, and so, you know, you do have to sort of think about you have real experimental errors um, that are actually coming into the physical part of your system. But your equations of motion are only set up given a perfect idealized world. Um, so you really need to think about how those errors are entering into your equations of motion as you integrate those equations to get to the next time step. Um, something else you're seeing is a discrepancy um, in time. Uh, remember, I said you had to synchronize the time between the numerical model and the physical model. Um, and to do that, you sort of have to take into account that your controls tend to be relatively deterministic, sampling at a very specific rate, but your numerical model um, you know, might take more or less time to solve for a particular time step. 
Um, and you need to make sure that those are in sync with each other. Um, and to make sure that they're in sync, uh, we've engaged in a three loop architecture um, that houses the control system on one machine. Um, and then it houses our, our uh, computation, our numerical model on, on a different machine. And then we actually have a, a, a middle machine that sort of handles the synchronization of those two pieces. Um, and so let's say your sample rate of your control system is 2000 Hertz, um, which is, I would say relatively fast, probably closer to a thousand, I would say for a typical control system for these types of tests. Um, and then you have uh, some sort of time step um, that you're integrating with in your numerical model. Um, then you need, need to select that time step so that you satisfy this, this, this sort of similitude requirement um, between the two that's sort of being handled by this middle loop. Um, because you can't change the, the, like, because you need to have like precise integers, um, that you hand, hand to the control loop, then how you choose this sort of in-between time step for your numerical model, it has to match that integer. So there's no real rounding that can be supplied. And so the error that you saw before was because we were rounding, I don't, I don't quite remember what that difference in time step was, but, but we were um, neglecting this, this rounding that has to occur. So you have a real integer. And so there was some slight discrepancy um, between the time synchronization between the controller and the numerical model. Um, what that actually looks like is something that is of course much more complicated when we get down to like the actual communication between all these different machines. Um, in this case, we're using a number of different very high performing computers in order to actually uh, do the real time hybrid simulation. Um, some of what you see here, they're basically glorified gaming machines. Uh, and then each of those machines is communicating um, through a fiber optic cable system and a shared memory network, um, shared memory scram net network. Um, one other thing that uh, we have to also think about is actually the, the control system itself. In this case of, of supplying the wind to the floating system, we're using a, a robotic arm. Um, and this is a non-trivial uh, um, controls problem, um, primarily because you have a floating system of which you don't really know the dynamics. And then you have uh, this sort of external disturbance from the wave coming in where you really don't have um, any prior knowledge of that wave coming in. So it's basically in still water, the wave comes in, but you don't really have prior knowledge that the wave is coming unless you're using sort of an external measurement uh, closer to the, the wave machine. Um, and so there's a lot of sort of unknowns here. And so dealing um, with the control scheme in order to supply whatever command the numerical model is spitting out at you um, is, is a non-trivial task um, and is something that, that we've been working quite hard on. Um, and so with that, I'll just sort of wrap up the presentation. I'm sure I'm over time. Uh, <laughs> so just, just uh, you know, we've done this approach in a number of different applications. It's certainly feasible. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's easy. Um, and we are testing this floating case later this month, which has been really exciting. Um, and hopefully we can share more about those results uh, after we've actually completed those tests. Um, but with that, I'd love to give acknowledgments to the number of people that have actually worked on this, this project. Um, so we've received funding from a number of different sources. We've worked with a, 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 a many collaborators, uh, formal collaborators, and then just special shout out um, to the student and postdocs that have worked on this project that actually have made these, these applications feasible. Um, and just this also has been a result with numerous informal discussions with the many with many collaborators. And so um, they've been really fantastic and sort of ironing out the kinks of coupling these two systems together. Um, and with that, uh, I guess I'll, I'll hand it back and maybe there'll be some questions. Um, okay, great, thank you all. Absolutely, thank you so much. Let's give both of our speakers a round of applause. Um, this is really exciting. So thank you both of you for sharing this incredible uh, research work dynamics in different ways. I saw uh, some elements of control on both aspects. Uh, and I'll go ahead and get started on the questions, but I also invite the audience to place your questions in the Q&A or raise your hand uh, so we can address that. So the first question that I had uh, for and it was, related to how you selected the cable candidates 
right? So you had some that were damaged. And I was curious about why that cable was selected. And also, like, how do you account for the degree of damage? Or if that was like, you know, is it the change of stiffness or added mass? Or like, how do you determine those? Yeah. So uh, if you notice, all of them were on the top face of the structure, because if you were, and we were doing uh, damage detection during the deployment sequence, as well as in connection, uh, especially at uh, just before the connection point, you had two cantilevers, so the tension face was at the top. So those were in the most high tension candidates. So those would be the ones that would experience the most, uh, the highest stresses. So that's why all of the cables were on the top face. And then I want to select one from each of the modules throughout the whole length of the structure. So it was just the top candidate within each module, the tensegrity uh, for just the one half. And because of due to symmetry, it was only just one half versus the whole structure because it was similar on both sides. In terms of damage, it was a literal presence or not presence. Like the mass was still there, but it was like the electromagnet would click it and it would just fall apart. So it would be a last, lack of contact. Um, mm -hmm. We didn't deal with like a, a percentage degree of damage. That's actually more of what we're doing now where we can scale it based on like the amount of change in the structure rather than just like a yes or no, because a cable is kind of there or not. There is some wear and tear, but in terms of a panel, we're looking more about like a change in stiffness over time. We're also looking at life cycle, so that would build into it. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, I see a raised hand by Professor Khalid Arasa. Would you like to unmute and ask your question? Yeah, hi. Th um, first of all, congratulations to both presenters. Great presentations. I have a question for Barbara, and it is about your experience of, uh, I guess, what has been easiest to model in the numerical model versus the experimental model? So how do you choose uh, which phenomena to treat as each. And the follow-up is what has been the hardest of the similitude relationship to to kind of like um, fulfill? Like you mentioned, it is very hard to do a uh, fruits number versus Reynolds number. So which one has been harder to scale appropriately? Yeah, yeah. Um, so, I'll, uh, so the first question, um, I have to admit that my background is in structural dynamics and there has been so much work in hybrid simulation on the structural side coming from out of the, the earthquake engineering field that that is by far the easiest approach. And that's what we started out with because that's just what was well understood. That's where our knowledge domain was. And, and it was, there was a lot of infrastructure already in place in terms of, um, open source uh, packages that we can use like open fresco, for example. Um, and then there was just like a lot of experience that we could leverage when it came to the structural dynamics side. So that first experiment that I showed um, with the, you know, cascading uh, earthquake tsunami effect on bridges, classic. Like if we couldn't do that, we couldn't do anything else kind of thing. Um, where that's been hard um, has been when we started including uh, soil effects and that's because our model just wasn't fast enough. Um, and so we had to like keep on idealizing the model, keep on pushing the bounds of what we could actually fit into real time. And we ended up with something that, that to me is actually too idealized. I mean, it's a proof of concept, but it's not something that I think actually pushes the limits. And so for that, we have explored parallel computing, um, mostly out using CPUs, um, but I have a project right now where we're exploring that with GPUs just because we need more speed um, basically on the numerical side. Uh, when you get to fluids, it of course becomes even harder, uh, mostly because uh, of my knowledge domain starts breaking down. I've gotten, I've gotten better. I'm, now I know enough to be dangerous, um, but it is, it is a whole different domain. And the way they think about problems is significantly different than the way that, at least from a structural mechanics standpoint, we think about problems. Um, and so we've been using OpenFast uh, to help us out with the aerodynamics. Um, you know, it, it's a less, it's a software we're less familiar with. We've had to get a lot of help um, from NREL um, just to hack into that software and make sure that we can communicate uh, with it appropriately. We had to do a lot of work just fooling around with it to make sure we understood the dynamics. Um, and so that was a very significant challenge. And there's still a lot of work to be done there. Um, we've really only done it in terms of the aerodynamics, we still haven't turned on the structural dynamics in that approach. We haven't actually looked at the effects of controls. Um, and so there's still probably a pretty long road ahead um, when it comes to, to open fast. It's not 
it's not exactly a uh, transparent program. Um, and then your second question, remind me what it was. I don't remember. I'm sorry. Uh, so, for example, if you if you are able to um, fulfill, let's say, uh, Reynolds number of scalability similitude, right. which are then then uh, so I guess if you fix one. And then let the other ones be free. So which one is the hardest to accommodate? I guess. Oh, Reynolds by far. But I don't Reynolds do that. that you have to do a wind tunnel sense. for that. Like, like that's yeah, the. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Other folks have done that. Um. So they, you know, I, so from my standpoint, when you look at the floating offshore wind problem, it, it it's really the unknowns are the hydrodynamics. Like if you look at open fast, like all the literature on it, they're like, oh well. You know, we got the aerodynamics down, um, but when we look at the hydrodynamics and the high frequency range, they don't match. Like, and it's because our discretization wasn't fine enough, or we didn't include nonlinear wave, like second order effects in the waves. And like, I, I, I mean, it's yeah. it, the wave models are relatively simplified. Yeah. So we've approached it from a hydrodynamic standpoint, but other people have looked at um, the opposite, where you house it in a wind tunnel, and then the it, the small. It, Reynolds number is just the time scale just becomes so small. And then your your experiment is so small that like it's just like a rigid body, like like it's a single degree of freedom system at some point. Um, and I've seen some approach that with machine learning applications to speed up the numerical side. Um, but it is not to undermine the work that my group is doing. I think that's that's a harder problem just because of the time scale. Yeah. Thank um, you. Yeah. That's actually a great segue for a question in the audience. I see on the chat, Iman Mansouri is asking a question related to, um, do you think AI could be used to optimize the simulation parameters in real time, predict outcomes more accurately, or even automate parts of the simulation process to effectively handle complex scenarios? This is a question for Barbara Simpson. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's a question for me. I hate AI. So this is going to be, uh, okay. No, I don't hate it. I think it's a very useful tool that when coupled with numerical algorithms that actually have the equations of motion there, if it's like a physics informed approach, then, then yes, it, it, it can definitely speed up, uh, the numerical side if done appropriately. Um, I'm, and I, I do have a student who, who's working in that area. Um, something that you just really have to be careful about um, is is when those equations of motion are not being satisfied um, and that you're that you're able to actually sort of I don't want to say extrapolate but like that you're not sort of bound by your training set um, so you know we don't really know what's going to happen in hybrid simulation that's why we're going to do these experiments if we could model it we would just model it um, and so you need to make sure that whatever model that you have of the the numerical domain, it, it needs to be able to account for the unpredictable. So, you know, it's hard. Um, and I think, I truly believe that if you couple the two together, like numerical models with machine learned models, you can get something really powerful. But to do something purely data-driven, that, that to me is harder to swallow, at least for these particular problems, um, just because you need to still be satisfying the equations of motion. Absolutely. Um, yeah, I completely agree. And I think you even opened up the, the discussion or the presentation about, you know, this is a very challenging problem that invites for other, the entire research community to start exploring other alternatives. So uh, this is, this has been such a great um, discussion. So I, I think, you know, I also extend the invitation to everyone uh, to attend the EMI conference, right? So I know that where we all continue to meet uh, at the committee, at the technical committee as well. Uh, I'll give a couple of seconds. I'll stop recording now uh, in case anybody, you know, wants